Just in case why you're wondering, I haven't taken my hat off. I haven't had a haircut for a few weeks, so I'm saving you all from that horrid sight. Okay, so indigenous or Aboriginal uses of the Tamer Valley, uh, it all goes back about 40,000 years. Oop, go back. So if we look at our map there, that's from about 14,000 years ago. As you can see in the map, uh, Bass Strait is starting to form there. If you go back 40,000 years, there was actually a land bridge to southeastern Australia, and that allowed many migrations of Aboriginal people to come through over that plain, they called the Bassian Plain, and come into Tasmania, in particular into the, the Tamer Valley area. Uh, as that, what happened was we had then a global warming period that started about 19,000 years ago. And as part of that, over the next 7,000 years, which was considered to be a very speedy period of global warming, so if you take that into comparison of what's happening today, you can see there's rather significant difference. So that global warming period went up to about 12,000 years ago. And in that time, the sea levels rose by 130 metres, and eventually we had Bass Strait formed, which cut off Tasmania from the rest of Australia and from the rest of the world. And for the next 10,000 years, Tasmanian Aboriginal people became the subtly most isolated people on the planet. So it was a hell of existence till 1642 when Abel Tasman bumped into the west coast, thought it was occupied by a land of giants and decided he'd better head off. So if we go here, that one. So we'll jump forward to that one. So here you've got the nine nations map of Tasmania. So you can see there is a number of different what we call nations or people often to refer to as tribes. And the one here of reference is, of course, the Northern Midland tribe, which was the home of uh, a various number of what we call bands or clans. So if I just go back another one. The societal structure of Aboriginal Tasmania, it's not that different to what we have today, actually. Uh, your everyday living unit was your hearth or family group, which was two to 12 people. Then you have clans or bands, which was 80 to 100 people. And then you had your tribes or your nations, which would form around 800 to 1,000 people. So if you're looking at the Nine Nations map there, you can see there's a number of little black dots on each nation, and that represents a clan or a band. So in the Northern Midlands tribe, we have identified three. That's the uh, Tyrano Pana people, Panaha, and the Lichramarana people. Now, in all likelihood, there will be more than three clans in the area. Um, that's all we've identified, because those three clans are going to make up around 300 people. So quite a few hundred people short. Uh, it's worth noting out these are European interpretations of people's movements and where they actually stayed. Uh, so it's not something that's uh, probably entirely accurate for the time. So I'll just go back another one. Now, now, I just want to point out this man here for a few of the cultural reasons, of, well, cultural artifacts that he's got. So he's got a fire stick. The one he's got there with the pointy stick, that's not a spear. Uh, spears were much thinner. That's a killing stick. So when you were hunting, your spear was a disabling weapon, not a killing weapon. So you disable the animal, then you run up and either whack it on the head with a waddy, or you kill it with a ki killing stick through the heart. It's got ochre in the hair. Uh, the ochre in the hair was probably done to stop um, infestations of nits or fleas and the women wouldn't ochre their hair, they'd actually cut it all off. The interesting one there is what's around his neck. That is a jawbone, and it's actually a jawbone of one of his relatives. So the burial and mourning practices in Tasmania varied between various people. Uh, the most thing that was most common though is actually when somebody died, you burn the body. Two reasons for that. One, you don't want your dead relative to be nibbled on by animals during the night, and of course, corpses tend to spread disease. So you have to burn the flesh off and then you collect the bones. And for some people, they would wear part of their dead relative around their neck for a period of about 12, well, 12 weeks, three months. And then at the end, they would take that off, uh, repatriate it with the rest of the bones and seal them up in either an earth tomb or a hollow tree, something like that, depending on what nation you belong to and what your practices were. So when it comes to the Tamer Valley, 
one of the important things here, of course, was ochre, which is in the hair there. And if you've never seen or touched ochre, this is it here, and I'll hand some around so you can just pass it around. So you've got red ochre, pink ochre, and I think the other one's yellow. So very different colours. And the Tamer Valley itself was, or it still is, home to many different types of ochre. Uh, so up and down the Tamer on the east and the western sides, there are different ochre mines around. And there is also one out at Rocha Lee. And interestingly, uh, back in the early 20th century, such was the um, prevalence of the ochre that a paint, or oh, a company set up a paint factory and they made 277 different colours of using ochre and linseed oil. So, uh, so uh, very significant, it gives you an idea of the significance if the, the non-Indigenous people found it was useful, useful as well. Of course, one of the most important things would be plants and food. So, when it comes to plants, in uh, the Tamer Valley, there, we don't have four seasons. So this attempt to shoehorn the European concept of four seasons onto our environment just does not work. There's actually six different stages. Now you take your starting point as the shortest day of the year, and from then on, when we start getting more sunlight, and the days are longer, you start to have the trees, and animals are doing things. And the first one is usually the wattle, which you can see there in full bloom. And that'll bloom up in late July, August. And that means about six to eight weeks later, you're going to have seed pods coming through and those seed pods will be edible. So it's a food source, it's a vegetable. Oop, go back one. Following on from that, you'll get your she-oak, which is very prevalent. Uh, and the little oak apples that come through on there, the little seed pods, before they actually turn to seed, they're edible. And uh, they taste a bit like Granny Smith apples. If you want to go and munch on a shio leaf, feel free, uh, and you'll get to see what it tastes like. Uh, now we're coming into warmer weather. We're going to have our cherries come through, so the native cherries, which are the little red ones there on the left. And they'll fruit up until about the end of January or end of February, thereabouts. And as they are starting to taper off, the currents will come through. And the currents will be there for about to the end of March, maybe a little bit further on if you're lucky. Then we get into our colder month fruits. Now these are very important because during the colder months you don't have a great deal of diversity of food. It's, you don't have a lack of it, but your diversity is a little bit limited. And two of your winter fruits, or colder month fruits, are your bush tomato and your kangaroo apple, which is also part of the tomato family. And does anybody want to have a guess why they call it a kangaroo apple? No, kangaroos don't eat it. It was, uh, well, the, before it actually fully ripens to that yellow colour there, it's mildly toxic and it will make you sick if you eat it before it's fully ripe. Uh, it won't kill you, but you want to be close to a toilet for a few days and no one's hogged the toilet paper. And our old people have worked out that to actually make it safe to eat, and most notably, taste a lot better because they taste awful, uh, is that you cook it, and part of the cooking process is you cook it in the stomach of a kangaroo, or a wallaby, or a patty melon, even impossible. Uh, interestingly, when the British got here, anything that hopped was a kangaroo. So you'll often see in history texts where they're talking about kangaroos, and that's actually wallabies. And of course, they're very prevalent in the Tamer Valley as well. Another one, this is a staple, a couple of staples, particularly for winter as well. Your sag, or your cutting grass, also known as snake grass, official name, Lamandra longifolia. Uh, that is a vegetable plant in winter and in summer. When it seeds up, you collect the seeds, you crush them up, you make a flower, and you grind them up, possibly with one of those. <laughs> Which is a, this is actually a dolerite ball, but it makes a grinding stone. And uh, you mix water with your flour, you've got a bread dough, and that's damper. You do the same with wattle seeds as well, pretty much any seeds. 
and you've got your bracken fern. Now, so your bracken fern, you can actually eat the fresh shoots of that, and the root, you can eat the root, and you can use the root as a medicine plant for treating jack jumper bites, and apparently it's very effective. Interestingly, with the bracken fern, when you start to pull it out of the ground, root and all, it actually releases a chemical, which tells the surrounding bracken fern it's under attack. And that surrounding bracken fern will, over time, just over a week or so, increase the toxicity of its root. So instead of becoming nutritious, it actually starts to strip the nutrients out of your body. Which is why you don't harvest bracken fern in a concentrated area for a long time. So you've got to be continually moving on your bracken fern. Now, a notable aspect of these two plants, your sag and your bracken fern, they need to be burned. They have evolved to be controlled by burning, low intensity burning, which was practiced by our old ancestors. And you've got to burn them to the ground. That will then, well you do that around April, May, and that then gives you about eight weeks later, fresh shoots coming through of both plants, and you can eat the fresh shoots. Uh, apparently the, the bracken fern shoots are nice if they're salted and done on the barbecue. The bracken fern shoots you just eat raw. It tastes like a sweet pea. And the best thing is that when the fresh shoots come through, you just pluck them out of the ground. You don't have to dig, dig them out. So it uh, reduces the labour intensity of it all. Another aspect of the Tamer Valley and finding food sources were fish traps, mainly up around Georgetown, uh, Clarence Point, places around there. There is still evidence of fish traps that were used. Uh, quite often they were just stone structures used to uh, capture fish as the tide goes out. So it's like a big pond. And then you go in and you harvest your fish or your stingray or a few other things as well. And of course, shellfish were very important as well. So oysters, in particular, up and down the Tama Valley, big food source. Interestingly, with the oysters, uh, when the British came here in 1806, uh, and when they did start making brick buildings, which wasn't until around 1824, uh, they sourced their lime as the, um, the leftover oyster shells they found in middens up and down the Tamer Valley. So they actually de destroyed hundreds of middens, but they didn't realise, of course, what they were. They just would have seen them as a rubbish dump of big shells, something to be exploited. That's why we have very few middens that can be found up and down the Tamer on both sides, because most of the middens were destroyed. One aspect of life in the Tamer Valley for Aboriginal people was ceremony. And Launceston being central to many different tribes, if you kind of cast your mind back to that map, there's the, the North East Tribe, the Ben Lomond Tribe, Midland Tribe, northern parts of the Big River people and the North Tribe. And they would come to Launceston and have ceremony up in the hills around us. And that is in the Trevallon Reserve, is marking a, a gathering site. And when people gather, they camp. So they have campsites as well. Oops, let's go back there. And of course, you might be asking, what about the gorge? One of the central features of the Tamer Valley. It was a place to gather for recreation. Uh, small ceremonies like initiations in particular areas in the gorge and food like big freshwater mussel. Used to be found in the gorge below the dam, what is now the dam, uh, they're extinct below the dam now because they don't get enough uh, water and oxygen, no nutrients. But uh, when they put the dam in, the water flow being reduced to what it is, reduced the nutrients and the oxygen levels in the river and the first basin, so these things went extinct. And just to really finish off, some Aboriginal names, of course you know Kanamaluka, there's also Pond Rebel, which refers to the Tamer estuary. For the South Desk River, we have Mangana Lienta, which means big fresh water on the plain. Uh, Moonronaro, which means big fresh water. And we also have, uh, what's that? Moonronaro, Mangana Lienta, oh, Plebotomala, which means fresh water. And on the subject of fresh water, Lagana also means fresh water, but in another language, means fresh poo. <laughs> so take your pick which one you want to use. Thank you. <laughs>